Good afternoon, welcome. I'm so very grateful that you've joined us here once again today. I'm Alina Dorian, the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice, as well as Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. But I've also been a school principal for 10 years. Therefore, I'm even more excited that you've joined us now for our seventh in a series of webinars titled Principal Practices for Safe Schools. I wanna quickly take a moment to thank our collaborating partners, the UCLA School of Education and Information Studies, the California Safe Schools for All team, the California Department of Education, the Association of California School Administrators, and our California Connected Consortium consisting of the California Department of Public Health and our academic partner, UC San Francisco. As we all know, the state's Safe School for All team released guidance for school reopening in mid-January, and under that K-12 through consolidated framework, the state provided detailed guidance and continues to update that guidance on school reopenings as the situation in the state evolves. Today, we're very lucky to have with us insightful public health experts, as well as incredible school administrators who will share their knowledge and insight on school-based sports during COVID-19. Our hope is to create a dialogue to better inform, empower, and create confidence in the decisions we need to make to open our schools, to run school-based sports programs, and to keep our schools safe. I'll try to keep a bit of time at the end so that we can address some of your questions. Please use the Q&A button to enter your questions and thank you for all of those that submitted questions ahead of time. All of your questions and comments are very valuable in helping us design this series to truly meet your needs. So please help me welcome our panelists for today. We're honored to have with us Ms. Trudy Raimundo. Ms. Raimundo served in San Bernardino County since 1990 and began working in public health in 1997. She became the San Bernardino Public Health Department's director in 2012. And in June of 2020, she transitioned to the California Department of Public Health as the head of external affairs for COVID-19 response, which includes overseeing tribal affairs. We're also very happy to have an amazing team from Mendez High School. First, we have Mr. Mara Batista, the proud principal of Mendez High School in Los Angeles County since 2011. He's a huge supporter of high school athletics, truly believing in its importance in higher academic achievement, in connectedness to the school, and in the social and emotional well being of his students. Mendez High opened in 2009, and in its short history, it has 25 league titles, three CIF LA City GPA awards three CIF LA City Championships, and one Esports Pacific Region Championship. I too would be a proud principal. Our duo is rounded out with Mr. Javier Contreras, Athletic Director, ELD Teacher, and Academic Recruitment Coordinator for Mendez High. Mr. Contreras is in his 35th year in education and seventh at Mendez High School. He proudly proclaim, pro proclaims that being the athletic director in Mendez is his dream job. He received a BA with teaching credentials from UCSB and a master's in education administration from Cal State LA. As a wise educator, he's guided by two important quotes. The first, it's okay not to know something, but it's not okay to keep not knowing something, which I think is very apt for today's webinar. And a second yet powerful motto is make the world a better place just by being kind to others. We're also very pleased to have with us Mr. Victor Doan, cross country head coach, middle school wrestling coach, as well as a biology and sports medicine teacher at San Leandro High School in Alameda County. Mr. Doan has been a high school teacher for 19 years and a coach for over 20. He received his BS in biology from UCLA, go Bruins, a master's in education and teaching credentials from UCLA, a double Bruin, and an administrative credential from Cal State East Bay. He's recognized for his outstanding work as a teacher, placing as a finalist for California Teacher of the Year in 2014 and winning District and County Teacher of the Year in 2013. So once again, thank you all for being here. And now it is my great honor and privilege to invite Ms. Trudy Raimundo. Ms. Hi, everybody, and welcome. And thank you, Dr. Dorian, for inviting me this afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here and provide a couple of updates to uh, this group around youth sports, but I think some other exciting updates um, that I think you will be excited to hear about. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. 
see if I can find it. <laughs> Here it is. All right. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for coming together. I want to talk a little bit about uh, school-based sports with this group and then provide a couple of updates and hopefully answer some questions at the end. Um, some of the topic areas I'm going to cover today are around testing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about confidentiality, um, how to do notifications for positive cases. Um, I want to talk a little bit about athlete mental health because I think that's probably a very important topic that um, I think we haven't necessarily dove into, um, as well as spectators and stable groups. So, to start off a little bit um, where the guidance is in our Q&A. So I think everybody probably already knows where to find our youth sports guidance as well as our frequently asked questions. All of those can be found on the California Department of Public Health website. Um, and so they are there for you to view and to download as well. Um, couple of things that I do want to point out is that certainly over the last couple of months, we've made quite a few updates to um, that particular guidance. So I would really encourage you to check it often. Um, we're also getting ready to update the frequently asked questions um, so that it more um, aligns with our current guidance. So be on the lookout for that as well. A couple of things that I think this group will be excited to hear about in terms of recent updates. Um, for the youth sports guidance, we've recently updated it to actually allow for spectators and observers now. Um, I think previously you had seen that there were limitations on observers. Um, that was really um, intended to help protect um, our youth through this process until we were able to put out some really good guidance around um, how to deal with spectators and observers. So most recently, we've actually uh, posted what we call outdoor seated live events and performances and indoor seated live events and performances. And so those two particular updates uh, really help to govern how to deal with audiences and spectators and observers, both for outdoor and then recently as of last night for indoor sports as well. So I think that's an exciting update for all of you. So now um, family and friends can come and visit and watch um, their youth play both in an outdoor setting as well as an indoor setting. Um, for the outdoor setting and the indoor se setting, um, you'll find where we are allowing concessions now um, across the board. And we've also added flag football to our list of moderate sports there as well. Um, the other exciting update that we recently did with the youth sports update is we actually um, removed the limitation around only being able to play with teams either within your county or with a neighboring county. So we've now opened that up um, with the ability to play um, with teams from across the state. Um, our local health department partners, those do, do still kind of sit in the driver's seat around those things. So um, they still have the authority to be able to authorize um, these kind of cross county sports. Um, but I think that's also incredibly exciting, um, especially for many of our schools as we've heard through, um, you know, in our rural northern areas and things like that, um, but does allow for inner team competitions for other teams across the state. Um, I think I've already talked a little bit about our indoor and outdoor live events guidance um, and how that affects youth sports. Um, another quick update is, and not necessarily around youth sports, but a couple things that um, you may want to be um, cognizant of is that we also recently posted private events guidance, um, and it's not listed here, but gathering guidance as well. Um, that private event guidance is something um, that you can actually follow for proms um, and other kind of ceremonial or other private events that you may want to host at the school. And the gathering guidance is really uh, intended to provide you some guidance and some capacity limits for some of those smaller, possibly more um, social informal gatherings as well. So going back now to youth sports, um, I wanted to really just take the time to be able to answer several questions that I know many of you probably have. Um, just to recap really quickly, 
quickly within the youth sports guidance. Um, there are several areas um, that require testing. Um, they are for football, rugby, and water polo, and we really uh, chose those three particular sports because of a couple of factors. Number one, um, because of the, the amount of time that many, many of the players will spend next to each other. So whether it's uh, somebody that's on the line um, with scrums and things like that, it's really a lot of just very close contact um, amongst the individual members. Uh, the other thing too with um, uh, water polo is oftentimes, and even I think football, um, oftentimes the players aren't wearing masks, certainly not in water polo because um, we never want a player to be wearing one while um, you know, in instances where it may get wet and become a hazard. So um, that's that was also, you know, one of the driving factors in terms of picking those three particular sports. Um, I see there's a question here around whether or not there are any exceptions uh, to testing for students. Um, assuming we're talking about uh, student athletes, um, there are, and it's actually within the K-12 school guidance as well. So. And you'll hear me often go back to this K-12 school guidance because it really, I think one of the things that I would love to highlight here and, and you know, gently remind everybody is these athletes are students as well. Um, and so I'll often go back to that, um, making sure that they are continuing to follow the school policies and the school guidance um, around whether if it's notification process, but also any identified exemptions. Um, in terms of exemptions, um, what you will find is that for students or student athletes, um, and this is a question that's come up, if there's been a prior infection, um, they can be exempted from the routine uh, screening and testing requirements um, for up to 90 days, because we know oftentimes um, they will just continue to test positive at that point. Um, coaches are required to test at the same cadence as athletes as well. A um, couple of questions here on how can teams and sports ensure confidentiality, um, athletes testing positive, and the process for notifying the team members. Um, these are two things where I'm going to go back to the comment I made about these athletes being students as well. Um, these are areas where you really need to go back to the K-12 guidance. Um, a lot of it will dictate how you ensure this confidentiality. Much of it is really working with your local health departments um, and making sure that they are aware when you become um, cognizant of or aware of a positive case of amongst your particular team members or your athletes, um, working very, very closely with your local health departments. Um, they are the ones that can work very closely with you around contact tracing, um, but also be able to do that while also ensuring the confidentiality um, of the entire team. Um, and all of that confidentiality really goes back, it doesn't matter if they are an athlete or if they're a student, we need to, um, we need to continue to maintain the confidentiality. Um, and that really is cognizant upon the school. Um, again, you know, if athletes are testing positive, um, I cannot say this enough, um, the need to closely work with your local health department and let them know that a member of your team has tested positive. Um, they will work with you. The schools already should have a communication process or a communication system in place um, as they would with any other student in terms of being able to notify either parents um, or other folks within the classroom. Um, it's the same thing with being able to notify other team members. Um, you should continue to work through that communication system, um, but the local health department can help you craft what that messaging needs to be. Um, so again, work very, very closely with your local health department. Um, they will go through the contact tracing process with you. So it's gonna be a partnership helping to identify any potential uh, close contacts for that athlete as well. Um, there's a question around if a student athlete tests positive um, and also attending in-person classes, does their stable group need to quarantine as well? Um, and this is, you know, I think, you know, as much as we would love kind of a, a, a 
answer, a very specific answer to this question. Um, it really just depends. And I think that's also, you know, something that you'll see in the K-12 school guidance. Um, it's not always going to be the case that an entire class needs to quarantine or the stable group. That's why you need to work with a local health department. They need to determine, you know, who the close contacts for that athlete is. Um, oftentimes, you know, viewing, if you've got it, be able to provide them any video footage that you've got. Um, they'll take a look very closely to determine who those close contacts are. Um, they'll work with you on notifications for those close contacts. Um, and it may be just a small segment of the team or the stable group, or depending again on the level of exposure, it may end up being the stable group. Um, again, there is no state answer for this. It really just depends on the unique situation and hence why working with your local health department is really critical. Um, in this process. Um, are there age restrictions for the consent forms? The consent forms are a requirement um, for the high and moderate contact sports. Um, and so for any kids work, um, playing those high and moderate contact sports, um, while they are in that kind of area where it's a no age restriction around the consent forms. And it really is, the consent forms are really intended to make sure the parents understand the risks to their kids of playing these high and moderate contact sports. So it's really just making sure they're aware of the risks um, in terms of uh, the level of transmission, um, the risks to the student's health and those kinds of things and what they might need to um, consider if the student needs to go into quarantine. Um, in terms of athlete mental health, I think one of the things um, that I just wanted to talk about. And I see there's a, a question here about how can schools protect the privacy of students who test positive if their team and stable group has to quarantine. Um, and this is again, the local health department is gonna work with you on doing those notifications, but also ensuring the privacy of the individual uh, team member, team member um, who's become positive. Um, I think one of the things, and this actually goes to the second question, one of the things that I would really encourage um, any coaches, school administrators, anybody that's listening um, is to really prepare schools and teams because we know students have returned um, to play and they've returned to play for what are considered, you know, at risk activities. Many of them are very much high contact or moderate contact. And especially for those um, that are now even doing indoor sports, um, there's going to be positives. Um, I, that is just what happens as we return to some of these activities. I think where what we need to do is really start to build um, uh, some messaging and a climate where these positives are going to happen. And I think that's an area where we've not done a great job of preparing um, these youth athletes as well as the teams um, in that particular event. Um, but it's going to happen. And being able to message that this is going to happen, um, but that we really need to continue to follow the recommendations from the local health departments, continue to follow the recommendations under the guidance, the requirements under the guidance is really intended to continue to keep our schools um, and these athletes and their families ultimately safe as well, because they do ultimately go back um, to their families. And so that's really just something I wanna highlight um, the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is we have been in some really great conversations with CIF. Um, they've been incredible partners with us through this entire process. And they're very excited to start working with us on how to do some of this messaging to start promoting kind of a an anti-bullying climate? Um, and how do we better prepare our youth and our teams um, in that instance when a positive does come up um, and, an, and a team may have to quarantine and possibly have to miss a game? So I'm excited. I think that's gonna be a great opportunity and hopefully um, you're excited as well. I think it's a, it's a great way of marrying both the uh, uh, public health um, piece of it, but also understanding that CIF is such an influential partner um, when we're looking at youth sports. Um, and so I'm excited about that possibility um, and really designing some messaging to get us um, 
uh, through these next couple of months and really working with you on helping to design some of that and disseminate that as well. Um, couple of things around spectators and stable groups as well. Um, how can schools enforce limitations on the number of spectators? Um, with the outdoor and indoor seated live events and performances, uh, one of the things that you will notice and I think is important to point out um, is that it does require number one, assigned seating, um, but also um, kind of this idea of advanced registration. So one of the best ways that you can help to limit um, spectators is to make sure that there's only a limited number of tickets that are provided um, for some of these particular activities. That way you ensure you're staying within the state guidelines in terms of capacity limitations, but also making sure that you're providing adequate space um, to ensure that there's appropriate physical distancing between the individual households. Um, and I know this idea of students being able to participate in multiple sports if the community transmission rate is low. Um, this is another question um, that I think has come up quite a bit. And we do have language and we have some strong recommendations and I have to say very strong recommendations about maintaining stable groups um, within our youth sports guidance. Um, we do that really to help continue to protect um, the health of the individual students, as well as they, if they move back into the community, moving back into their families. Um, it, is a, it, it is just a recommendation at this point. It is not a requirement uh, to maintain those stable groups, um, but I do strongly recommend it. Um, again, it really just helps to continue um, to mitigate any risk of community transmission, and that's why we put it in there, but it is not a requirement at this point. Um, it is just a recommendation. And so with that, um, I will stop sharing and uh, turn it over to Dr. Dorian. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Raimondo. That was so um, a lot of information. I know in the Q&A, we've been getting a lot of questions and okay. I know we're trying to answer them as you were speaking, but we'll continue to um, answer them as we go through all of these presentations. But That's I also great. wanna say that as uh, Ms. Raimondo was speaking about all of those different documents, we have in the chat, Put the links to each and every one of Great. those as well so keep kind of looking in the chat if you need to look at that um, information and i know we also answered a question about this is state guidance that we're presenting so it's important to also understand that you do have some local guidance from yes. your local health jurisdiction that may be stricter than the state mm -hmm. guidance so really understanding what each one of the counties also does is important. So thank you again Ms. Raimondo for all of this information we're going to call you back in a little bit for a all right Thank you. And now I'm very pleased to invite Mr. Mauro Batista and Mr. Javier Contreras. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mauro Bautista. I'm the proud principal of Mendes High School, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, my name is Javier Contreras. I'm the athletic director at uh, Mendes High School. We call it the happiest place on earth, and I'm uh, definitely honored and humbled to be here. Thank you. Dr. Dorian and UCLA staff for inviting us. So we're gonna talk about return to sports and at Mendez, we have a saying, if you stay ready, you don't have to scramble to get ready. And that's what we've done. We've stayed ready from the jump. Uh, once the pandemic uh, hit last year, uh, we started to prepare in the summer for the return to athletics. And so if we can go on to the next slide. And so one of the things we did was in the summer, we started to meet with all of our athletes, returning athletes, incoming athletes, uh, and new athletes. And we started to meet with the parents. Uh, we wanted to let them know where we were as far as sports and the sports that were going to be available. We talked about preparation in case there was a season. And then we started to outline the criteria in a normal sense, GPA, um, what we call the athletic clearance criteria, and then sports physicals. And before I go on, I, I do want to go ahead. Let me just point out to everyone in the meeting that these meetings were virtual. That picture that you see there is a picture of pre-pandemic meetings. We don't want anyone to think that we had a super spreader event in summer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Bautista, for, for clarifying that. Um, and then I do want to also mention that 
last night um, when I was getting ready for this presentation, I, I said to my wife, who's a Bruin um, and a school teacher, uh, a national board certified teacher, I said, honey, tomorrow I got this presentation with UCLA and uh, over athletics and, and healthcare and the, the health of our students. And I said, wouldn't it be great? I think it would be great if you made me breakfast in bed so I can prepare for the meeting. And the wonderful wife that I have said, you know what, you want breakfast in bed, sleep in the kitchen. And so I, I don't know how well that joke's gonna go off uh, with this crowd and, and not having noise, but I hope you enjoyed that. Let's go on to the next slide. And so uh, if, um, if you're not aware with Athletic Clearance, um, Athletic Clearance is an online platform. And what it does is allows the kids to do all their paperwork electronically. Um, we have it on the Mendez website. And so the kids can actually go to the Mendez website, click where it says Athletic Clearance. And there they get a form that walks them through, including videos, award-winning videos that I've put together so that it teaches them how to create their account. And then on there, we also have access to the sports physicals that they can download, a pre-preparation form, and it talks about GPA. Um, and so this really was uh, instrumental in helping us be prepared and get our athletes prepared. There are some schools that still use the old paperwork form, and this really helped us to prepare. And anything to add, Mr. Bautista? I just want to share that this athletic clearance allowed us to, uh, what, would you, what you already mentioned, allowed us to clear students without them ever needing to physically, continuously come to school. And so it's something that uh, we purchase. Um, we're trying to get the district to purchase it for all schools, but right now it's an out of uh, out of pocket cost for us. And uh, but it's it's been a it's been a godsend for our program in just allowing kids to. Uh, also text me or call me, uh, email me if they're having any questions without having to have in-person contact, especially early on when the pandemic was really, really raging and out of control. If we can go to the next slide. And so in addition to the online platform for the student athletes, we also went ahead and created an online platform using Google, uh, the, the Google Docs. Um, and the Google folders for our coaches. And so instead of me having to be at school and receiving all their certifications, we started to take electronic certifications from our coaches. And all they had to do was go through the classes uh, or update their uh, cert certifications that have expired, put them on the platform, email me and let me know that they were cleared, and then we would clear our coaches. And so we were very vigilant about making sure that our coaches uh, did that. Uh, the coaches were also able, they also have an athletic clearance, athletic clearance and home campus, for those of you that are aware uh, of home campus, are connected. And so our coaches were also vigilant about making sure their athletes were cleared. And this was done prior uh, to opening. Now, after opening, we now have testing um, and something called the daily pass and uh, protocols that we were, we met with the district and they gave us these protocols that we're now following. And as uh, Dr. Dorian mentioned, you cannot lessen the state guidelines, but at you, uh, with uh, LAUSD, we have made our guidelines a little bit more strict um, uh, in, just because of the area that we live in, the county that we live being impacted by COVID. Um, and so if we can go on to the next slide. And so the district at our district meetings, uh, we understood and incorporated what the athletic policies were. The coaches' expectations were set out by LAUSD. The scholar athlete expectations uh, were set out uh, for, for us and the parent expectations were set out for us. And we went over these both in district meetings, league meetings and athletic director meetings as well. And we were very well versed in what we needed to do and we made sure we communicated communicated that to our parents. Anything to add um, to that, Mr. Bautista? The, the only thing I'll add is that um, the district, of course, as I'm sure districts throughout the state have been very proactive about making sure that once students return, that there would be a process in place that would ensure their safety and of course the safety of those around them. 
And so in LAUSD, student athletes have to be tested once every seven days at an LAUSD site. And then there's this thing in LAUSD called the daily pass that's connected to the testing. So any student who tests positives will not be able to get a daily pass. And if your test is older than seven days, you cannot get a daily pass. And without the daily pass, you cannot enter campus. So that's been very, very helpful in ensuring that uh, we've been able to now uh, be in, back in athletics over a month. We haven't yet seen a positive result. If we'll go on to the next slide. And that's actually what Mr. Bautista went over right now, um, the daily pass. He just basically went over all of it. And one of the things I'll add is that it's once a week and we do let the kids know there are various locations and the website they, they have to use. And this goes for coaches and anyone entering campus uh, has to get this daily pass as well. It is connected to a COVID test. And so once you see a daily pass, you'll know that a kid uh, or a student or a coach is also cleared um, negatively uh, as far as a COVID test. If we can go on to the next slide. So then we did have, we have had some return to sports meetings uh, with our parents. Again, they have been virtual. I know that picture there uh, doesn't lend credence to that, but, um, and what we did was we went over the, pro, uh, the protocols uh, for COVID, our practice schedules, our game schedules. We talked about no lockers, uh, bringing their own water bottles. Masks being optional during competition, but uh, during the warmups and everything else, we did make we have made masks um, not optional, but we have made them mandatory. And Mendez, uh, we follow all scientific information, so anything that we get from the CDC, we will uh, quickly incorporate that uh, if it's not incorporated already. And if we can go on to the to the next slide. And so we're ready to play ball. Uh, one of the uh, criteria for putting kids uh, on buses is now 12 to one. So we have to be very flexible. Everything is in a constant state of flux. And a week ago, we did not have that criteria for 20. We had a criteria of 24 for one per bus. And then all of a sudden it changed. And we were very flexible and we got the extra buses we needed to get our, our coaches and, and players uh, safely uh, to the ball games. Um, all coaches and athletes need daily passes, temperature checks. We had a league policy of no fans, but that has quickly changed. And so we're starting to uh, change our policies as well. And again, the goal at Mendez is always to keep people safe um, and just stay up with the latest information regarding the pandemic. Um, and is there anything to add, uh, Mr. Bautista? Um, no, we're just, I guess the last thing to add is we're very excited that uh, athletics are back and um, we're very, so going back to the first uh, uh, slogan that Mr. Contreras shared, if you, if you stay ready, you don't have to be ready. We're very proud that we're uh, a school that once athletics came back, we fielded a team in every single sport with the only exception of swim because we don't have a swimming pool and the city part, the city, the city pools are not yet open. So it, obviously that became impossible, but for every other sport, we have fielded a team and both uh, girls and boys. And many of the schools have not. Many of the schools have dropped sports and we've been able to field it. We actually found out yesterday, um, mid evening, that basketball was back and we just jumped on the, the, the phone and started making phone calls and texts and we're ready to go. We're just hoping that we have opponents to play. And so we thank you and we'll take any other questions, I guess, later on. But uh, thank you for letting us be a part of this presentation. We hope it has been helpful. Thank you both so much. I'm sure I would be super proud to be a student in your school, and that sounds great. And now I'm going to turn the virtual podium over to Mr. Victor Doan. Hi, thank you, thank you everybody for having me here. Um, we I've just finished my cross country season, and uh, I just want to talk about like uh, what we did to keep uh, athletes safe, and then uh, maybe some ideas for other sports also. Uh, we, you know, we went through the whole season and we had about 60 runners and, you know, uh, no uh, uh, COVID cases and stuff. And so I thought it was wonderful. And I'm glad that students got to compete and practice and, you know, just get out of the house. Um, and let me start here. So for us, what uh, we did was we did small uh, cohorts. I actually had to ask um, 
and uh, we, we have to hire an additional uh, assistant coach so we can have uh, more coaches so that we can have smaller cohorts about 12 uh, per coach that you know minimize the contact between this uh, the athletes and then if we had little meetings or something before or after uh, they had to be masked during those times so anytime that they were not actually running, they had to be math. And once they were running, uh, they, we actually created multiple routes so that people, uh, you know, our athletes did not have to cross paths too often. And we we're able to do that pretty easily. Uh, before uh, the athletes came in, uh, we also have a system like uh, Mendez High School there where they have to uh, do a self check to make sure they are symptom free. And then for our athletes, we really had a meeting, uh, you know, at a meeting at the beginning of the season and everybody had to make sure they uh, had a parent at the meeting and we stressed personal responsibility. That means outside of practice, outside of uh, situations, they were to, you know, have safety practices, right? They were not supposed to gather in large groups, get together with friends and stuff like that uh, so that it minimized risk to the team and themselves. And, the, you know, they, they understood that. And like I said, we were successful and we had no problems with that. Um, what I thought was interesting as we adapted to this pandemic is I actually was one of the coaches that coached a virtual team, which means we actually did not come into practice, but I actually used Zoom. And I used Zoom and their dial-in feature so the kids can have their phones on. And as they use, uh, we, I also used this uh, app called Strava and the, the Strava monitored their distance, pace, and after they did the run, they, uh, they uh, what do you call it, clocked it. And I was able to see it in, in real time, I was able to see, oh, whoa, great job. You did 730 pays for, you know, X amount of miles and so forth. So they were able to use the phone, not to only uh, hear what I was telling them in terms of instructions, but um, Strava so that I can monitor what they were doing and they could monitor themselves. And some of them got really into it and try to meet all these crazy uh, weekly goals of running like 30, 45, uh, you know, 50. We had one athlete run 50 miles per week, pretty uh, on average. Uh, and then also Remind 101, which is a great app that, you know, uh, is able to make mass an, uh, announcements without needing inf uh, uh, numbers from the athletes. So they could contact me and I can contact them pretty easily and make, um, you know, any changes necessary throughout the day, throughout the season, whatever. And then uh, we had, you know, um, we wanted to make sure during competition things were safe because we were able to easily control our practices. But sometimes competition, you know, you're talking about different teams, different, you know, standards and so forth. But um, we started the season actually virtually. We had a, a couple of meets where we ran as a team only. And then we sent in those times. Those times were definitely not as equal because some people, you know, uh, were choosing different terrains that might have been a little more difficult or easier, but the kids were just happy to be competing and, um, you know, practicing. And I think that was the most important takeaway for me. They didn't really care too much about the, uh, how they actually did, but they actually got to do it. Uh, in person, some of the meets we uh, have were staggered. Instead of having all 12 schools, we did it with two or three schools. And then just again, to minimize the number of people. Uh, and you know, throughout the season, we did not have spectators, but uh, you know, learning from uh, Ms. Trudy today that you know, things are changing rapidly on that front. And I guess it would have been different if uh, the season had gone for a few more weeks. And then, of course, during the competitions, we actually, uh, you know, had the mask uh, measures. So when they were not actually competing, they had to have masks on. And I thought I'd kind of throw in, like, I did this uh, just for cross country. But I think there are definitely ways to, uh, you know, uh, apply this to other sports. Uh, main, my, my main thing, I would say, is to keep practices outside if possible. Um, you know, a, a lot of our sports, even, you know, some of the indoor sports like volleyball and uh, basketball and stuff, you can definitely kind of modify things for outside. Um, conditioning and practices, you know, um, are probably similar to cross country in terms of fitness. And so a lot of modifications we did could be applicable. But one thing I thought was interesting is using Zoom. I've been able to use Zoom actually to lead a, a cohort of kids, uh, athletes, uh, about 15 uh, athletes, through the, actually the whole last year. And um, I'm very into fitness and I would lead these workouts. And I thought it was just interesting to be able to use Zoom. And so now uh, for the last 13 uh, months here, I've been leading three workouts a week and the athletes have been uh, very well 
I, I think they've taken it very well because first of all, they've gotten the physical exercise, but they have also had a coach lead them through it. And so they've had a lot more accountability and then just the connection within the smaller cohort. Uh, you know, I, I did it as a test run for myself and for these athletes and they've really improved and appreciated uh, the time we've had together. And then for myself as the leader of the practices, I was doing the uh, conditioning myself. And I, um, I like to say, I think uh, at 42, I might be in better shape than I was at 25 and um, I was in pretty good shape at 25. So I hope uh, you guys are able to use some of these ideas as uh, you guys are starting other seasons and other sports, but uh, I was able to carry out uh, a successful cross country season. And although it was a little smaller than um, previous years, I've had teams as big as 175, uh, at least those 60 kids that did sign up and do it had a great time. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop the share here. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Doan. I love the idea and with cross country, we know it was earlier in the year. So you actually had the most requirements and sort of thinking through what you needed to do. Um, and I just really appreciate all of you in the school system talking through um, and hearing just the positive vibes. I know as an administrator, just the nerves every night of trying to figure out what's the right decision, what's the best decision, how do we do it? Always putting our students first and thinking about what that looks like. So I'm very grateful to hear um, just ideas and sort of how you thought through all of this. So I'm gonna now ask our school administrators to begin with a round of poignant questions for our public health expert, Ms. Raimundo, if we're good with that. Mr. Bautista, can I please ask you to start us off? Yes, question number one. How can schools protect the privacy of students who test positive if their team and stable group has to quarantine? Um, that's a great question. Um, and I think especially when we're talking about youth sports and the return to play, um, maintaining that level of confidentiality is especially important. Um, and again, it just really goes back to the skill, the school really needs to work with the local health department and really work with the local health department to do the notifications for anybody that they may have been in close contact close contact with, um, as well as, you know, the schools already should be prepared to maintain confidentiality, um, you know, irrespective of whether or not it's an athlete or a student. Um, we know we have, you know, um, student positives that may not be athletes. Um, they should already be using that same system and same process for that notification. They would with any other student in order to protect their privacy, whether it's either from the rest of the class, um, their stable group, or in these instances from their team as well. Thank you so much, Ms. Raimondo. I think important to realize also just in athletics, there is such camaraderie and maybe sometimes mm -hmm. using that in the, in the positive, which is really understanding, helping to keep each other safe and that the importance is, you know, protecting one another if one of us does get sick and really yeah. thinking about what that means, sort of those higher ideals of athletics in general. Uh, Mr. Contreras, I believe you have a question. Yes, what safeguards are in place if an athlete gets COVID-19 uh, to protect family members uh, that they live with since many are in multi-generational homes? Um. This is a great place. I would love to point all of you to um, our CDPH website. Um, there is an area that has some really great communications toolkits, um, and many of them actually are focused around how to protect individuals and families um, when a family member becomes positive in a multi-generational household. Um, so I would point you to that site. It's got some really great tips on um, isolation for the individual, um, how to protect them, even when oftentimes, you know, um, often, you know, our standard practice is, you know, they should be isolated in a separate bedroom, hopefully with a separate bathroom. Um, but oftentimes we know that's not always, you know, a luxury or the case. And so going back to some of the tips that we've got on that CDPH site um, on how to safely isolate, how to safely quarantine, um, and hopefully we can put some of those resources in the chat as well. Um, but there are definitely some very dedicated resources um, for protecting the family and multi-generational households. So would really encourage all of you to take a look at those resources. And I'd, I'd like to add that counties also have their resources that they've been mm -hmm. thinking about, right? Just wraparound services for families and really what that looks like. So I would look at your county 
uh, resources as well as you're right. thinking about all of this. Uh, Mr. Don, uh, I believe you have a question. Uh, yes. So, uh, you know, since I'm finished with my season, I'm looking forward to next season. I was wondering how does reopening of the economy on June 15th as proposed by uh, Governor Newsom, how's that going to impact the tiers and sports that will be uh, happening? Um, great question. We've been getting it a lot um, ever since the announcement from the governor with this date of June 15th and this idea that the, the blueprint theoretically goes away. And so those very specific kind of guidance that's tied to the blueprint, the same way that the youth sports guidance is tied um, to the blueprint blueprint. I don't want to say they necessarily go away. Um, what will probably happen, though, is that, you know, one of the things that I think folks um, missed as part of the presentation is that there is an aspect of continued public health recommendations and guidance um, that we will continue to put forth um, past June 15th. So it's not a June 15th is kind of this open-ended, everything goes back to normal. Um, we will continue to want to put out broad public health recommendations and guidance, and especially I think important for the population that we're talking about, um, youth, because we know um, it's not going to be probably until May um, when our youngest um, population is going to be eligible for a vaccine. So by the time June 15th rolls around, we're certainly not going to have the same level of kind of vaccination coverage um, as we do with adults. And so it's going to be really contingent on us um, within CDPH to continue to put out um, public health recommendations and possibly even public health requirements um, to to continue to protect our youth um, until you know they get to that safe place where we've got good vaccination coverage for all of our youth. Because again, I think from a timing perspective, we know that this particular population, um, you know, we only have one vaccine right now that's eligible for kids 16 and 17. Um, I know there's some really great science out there and we've got our fingers crossed um, that soon we will have a pediatric vaccine. Um, by June 15th, we won't have the coverage. I think that will make us necessarily comfortable. Um, and so be on the lookout. We will continue to be pushing out um, broad public health recommendations and some common sense practices, you know, around continuing to mask. Um, I think, you know, even with vaccinations, um, there's still, you know, a lot of recommendations unless you are sitting with just fully vaccinated individuals and you know of that status. Even the CDC continues to recommend masking um, when you are around others that where you may not know what the vaccination status is. There is going to going to be kind of continuing evolution um, and emphasis on the role of testing um, as part of this process because we know, you know, not everybody um, will get the vaccine or will want to accept the vaccine. So testing will continue to be a very important measure. Um, and so th those are the things that we will continue, um, we will start to work on and hopefully start to socialize um, those broader public health measures well before June 15th um, so that everybody is well aware of kind of what happens on June 16th and it doesn't just kind of become this open-ended free-for-all but that we wanna continue um, some of these really public health um, measures uh, beyond that. Great, and I think one of the things we're also thinking about is coming up with a webinar after that to really think about, again, in the school setting, what does that look like past June 15th, but then what does that look like come fall, right? And so yes. sort of looking at that larger um, timeline. Um, Mr. Bautista, do you have another question? Yes, so speaking about vaccinations, do student athletes still have to quarantine if exposed to a positive COVID case if they are vaccinated? Um, Great question. So right now per the CDC, um, even if somebody is fully vaccinated, um, they do not have to quarantine if there is an exposure, but, and this is a huge but, that is if they remain asymptomatic. Um, and so we really need to be cognizant of this idea between asymptomatic and being symptomatic. Um, because even when somebody is vaccinated, um, if they become symptomatic, we actually encourage testing um, as well. So um, those are two of the things I think that are really important to point out um, is this distinction between you may be fully vaccinated, um, but also be cognizant if you're asymptomatic or symptomatic. Um, and there are, we continue to encourage 
um, some of the public health measures around quarantining, isolating, and even testing um, if the individual becomes symptomatic. But I think, you know, this is one of the questions we've been hearing a lot in general, but even around youth sports, this idea mm -hmm. of when coaches are vaccinated or even teachers are vaccinated, yes. what does that look like for exposure? Yeah. And now that we are starting to vaccinate our uh, student population, really trying to understand what that would look like and how helpful it will be yeah. to be able to, you know, not have to quarantine should you remain asymptomatic, just as you pointed out. Uh, Mr. Contreras? Yes, um, are masks still required for students who have been vaccinated? Um, again, this is one of those, if the student is fully vaccinated and they were, and, and we just recently actually put out uh, CDPH guidance for fully vaccinated persons. Um, and one of the recommendations we have in there is a household that is fully vaccinated um, can actually visit with another household that's fully vaccinated without masking or physical distancing. Um, the one caveat I wanna put out there though, especially if, um, students are continuing to play in sports, or if you're out in the general public, just because you're vaccinated, you should still continue to mask um, because you don't know the vaccine status of the folks that are around you. So really um, masking is still incredibly important, especially if there's any sort of um, unknown status of those that may be around you. So again, really wanting to highlight, I don't think I can say this enough, just because you're vaccinated, if you're going out into public, you should still absolutely mask. If you're still playing on a team and you're unaware because you don't know, you know, you may not know the vaccine status of the rest of the team members or um, the, the team members you're competing with, absolutely, you should still continue to wear a mask. And just kind of playing off of that, we had a question in the Q&A, which said the same question, except instead of masking, it was about testing. So if you have your athletes that are vaccinated, do they still need to be in that, um, you know, weekly testing pool of athletes? Um, you know, we're working on further guidance around that. I know that's a big question around the need for continued surveillance and screening testing, especially if you are um, vaccinated. So hopefully we'll get that out soon. Um, but again, even if you're, you know, in advance of that, even if you're fully vaccinated, if you become symptomatic, you should still test. Yeah. And so the key is really that symptomatic piece. Yes. And ensuring that, that's done. Very good. Uh, Mr. Doan, last question, please. Yeah, I was just wondering, are masks required uh, while student athletes are in practice or during competition? Yes, yes. Um, per the, the current um, CDPH youth sports guidance, masks are required for both practice and competition. Um, it, does, it does say as tolerated. So, you know, we really encourage coaches to be cognizant of whether or not, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the athletes, if, if they're having difficulty breathing, um, it, if it's really becoming um, difficult for them to breathe because of the heavy exertion and things like that. And that's why we include that, that caveat about as tolerated. We certainly don't wanna put the, 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 the health of the athletes at risk um, because they are wearing a mask. And so it really is contingent on coaches um, to kind of really watch um, their athletes. Um, there's another portion in there that I've gotten questions about um, because we also follow up the masking requirement with a caveat about looking at the AAP, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics um, around masking. And that is specific to um, when masks may become a hazard given certain sports. Um, and that's really the portion of that AAP reference that um, I think is important to highlight. Um, they do talk about when masks might become a hazard, um, for instance, um, with gymnastics. Um, and when you're on certain apparatus, it may get caught um, in the apparatus or in the equipment and actually may become a hazard. Um, so I do encourage folks to also take a look at, at, at those particular areas um, because we wanna make sure that the mask in of itself doesn't become a hazard. Um, and again, you know, just being mindful of um, how well the athlete is tolerating the mask, especially during heavy exertion. But, but it is a requirement both for uh, practice and competition. Thank you. We don't have much time, but before we switch it over for one second, I do want to say that the Safe Schools for All hub, right, the website that we mm -hmm. have, schools.covid19.ca.gov, 
there is a t technical assistance button there. So if any yes. of these questions, you know, any of the things that we've talked about, you're unclear about, you're not sure, you'd like to ask some questions specific to your school site, specific to your teams, please feel free to go there, fill out the form, and then we'll get back to you with information on, you know, uh, really related to your question. That Safe Schools for All hub is incredible. There's so many resources there, so please use it. It's been made just for us, for school sites, so please go, and we're going to put the link in the chat as well. We don't have much time, but I do want to switch it up and give Ms. Raimondo <laughs> the opportunity to ask our school administrators really quickly a question. Ms. Raimondo? Yeah, actually, and thank you for that. So what I would love to know is as principals, as athletic directors, and as coaches, um, you know, what advice do you have as kids come back and return to play? So one, one piece of advice that I have is um, before students return to campus, well, by this time, many students have probably returned to campus, but in the fall and summer, as you get ready to start a new port, it's always important to meet with parents so that parents know the expectations. So in LAUSD, a very important expectation was COVID testing. And we had to share the COVID sites and we let the parents know that they gotta be tested once a week. Uh, and then of course we had to explain the daily pass. So definitely the communication with parents is key. I also wanted to add flexibility. Things are in a constant state of flux and things are going to change and you just have to make sure that everyone who's on board with your athletic programs be flexible and that will help you through. And if you have to blame someone, don't blame anyone, blame the pandemic because that is what's causing all the mayhem. It's not people, it's the pandemic. And I do wanna add, we do have six period sports and just like uh, Victor had mentioned earlier, uh, that has helped us to return because we do have our athletes during six period where coaches were in constant communication with the kids and that has also been helpful. And I think, uh, you know, it, during this time, it's been incredible to think about all the th ways we've kind of like, you know, with Zoom, with, uh, you know, it, it's amazing what we could do. And just thinking outside of the box, think about what is the most important thing for your sport and think about are there alternative ways to do it safely, but be like doing it outdoors, doing it virtually. And I think just thinking outside of that box is going to uh, come up with new ways that might actually change the way you coach your sport forever. That's wonderful. And I think coming back to what you said, Mr. Bautista, I think it's so important to remember that it's a community and schools mm -hmm. are the center of that, right? They really bring everyone together, parents, teachers, students, faculty, staff, I mean, whatever we have. And so communication is key. And just coming back to that idea of the core values of athletics is that whole idea, right? Of your excellence and really being able to communicate with one another and thinking about that. So that's wonderful. Um, well, I, we don't have that much time, but this has been amazing and I'm super happy, but I do want to ask one question that was in the Q&A for Mr. Contreras and Mr. Bautista and the idea about testing. They asked a question of how do you test your athletes? They need to physically come onto campus for you to be able to test them or how do you actually run sort of that testing protocol for them? So LAUSD has numerous testing sites throughout the district. So we're in the, we're in the Bow Heights neighborhood here in LA City. And our testing site here in Boyle Heights is Hollenbeck Middle School. So students make an appointment online and then they go and then they get tested, COVID tested. Uh, as, as LAUSD is opening now, uh, now LAUSD is beginning to accept walk-ins. Whereas before you had to make an appointment, now they're accepting walk-ins and now Hollenbeck is also testing Saturday and Sunday as well. That's great. Thank you so much for that information. And now we have one minute left. So what I really want to do is thank you all for your incredible uh, advice, wisdom, insight. And I want to take this opportunity to invite our colleague, Shauna Olson, Program Advisor with the California Department of Public Health's California Connected Contact Tracing Program, to quickly fill us in on a new state resource that has just been launched. Ms. Olson, Thanks so much, Dr. Dorian. Thank you all for the opportunity to share this new resource that we have developed just for you, school administrators and staff. Um, and this is to help if there's a COVID-19 exposure in your school community. It's called the School Liaison Toolkit, and it contains information about contact tracing, including the school's role in working with the health department and how the school can help when there's a COVID-19 exposure in the community. 
There's a key terms document that contains definitions of public health terms and acronyms you may need to know to work with your health department. The decision tree is a flow chart to help determine when a staff or student should be excluded from in-person instruction or work because of a COVID-19 exposure or symptom. And then finally, there's a printable form so you can post the contact information about your local health department school specialist. And there's also a link to a directory of a designated contact at each health department across the state if you haven't been able to get in contact with your school specialist yet. So we hope that you and your staff will find this really useful. There is a link to the school liaison toolkit um, and the school specialist directory in the what's new section of the school's hub. I believe the link was already put into chat so you guys should have that. Um, the English version is posted now and a Spanish version of the toolkit will be coming um, in the next couple of days. So thanks everyone. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Dorian. Thank you so much, Ms. Olson. So everyone, thank you. A great, great big thank you to our esteemed panelists for their wisdom and insight. As I mentioned, this was our seventh webinar. So all of them are archived on that Safe Schools for All hub, schools.covid19.ca.gov. Just scroll to the center, you'll see it. It's the Virtual Training Academy. We have upcoming webinar next week, Thursday, four to five, will be on mental, emotional, and social health of students and staff during COVID-19. The following Thursday, four to five, which is April 29th, it will be wrapping up the school year during COVID-19, really focusing on end of school year activities such as AP testing, proms, graduations, et cetera, all of your questions answered with those activities. We also have a risk communication training for school administrators, directors, and counselors. One this Friday, April 16th. There's one coming up Friday, April 30th, and one on May 7th. All of that information is on that Safe Schools for All hub at the Virtual Training Academy. Thank you all for being here. I can't wait to see you all next week. Have a good night.